people. And he does that by helping people every single day. In fact, that is his mission to help to serve just like Jesse's is. And when you take a mission that's undisputable and you put it to action, you create results that are envious of everybody else within the circle of people that you associate with to the point where I see my credit guy everywhere when it comes to community support. That means he's giving back. I remember when the hurricanes hit Florida, giving back. I, I've been to events that he doesn't even go to that need some sponsorship because he's giving back. And the biggest thing is this. If you choose a credit partner, who whatever it is you choose, my choice is my credit guy. But if you choose a credit partner, choose one that creates results and choose one that is able to get in and educate. The fact of the matter is credit is very complex. I realize we view and see this thing every single day. And by the end of the day, we're like, yeah, we're credit experts. No, we're not. You're great at this relationships. You're great at mortgages. You're great at all this stuff. I'm in a private group and I see people all the time. They're like, Hey, Sam, my business credit is doing this. What should I do? And he's, he says this, listen, it, my old school people will recognize this. He says up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, BA, select start. That's unlimited lives, right? That's Contra for those of you that, that don't remember that time. That's so amazing. he gives to you the secret code in order to elevate to the next level. And what does that mean for our clients? That means that they have an opportunity to purchase the dream that has been provided to them by the protectors of our great nation year after year, decade after decade, and that's the dream of home ownership. And the only thing that separates them from that dream and where they are currently is some funny, silly numbers that somebody made up that nobody understands on a piece of paper that we pull when the time comes. And Jesse is going to help us understand those things today. With all that being said, I welcome my friend Jesse to the meet today. And Jesse, we got, well, it's, it's 207 my time. We got three o'clock. I don't know how much it's going to take you. I don't know how little, but it's all yours. Well, I appreciate the introduction. And I mean, you, as far as like referencing who my credit guy is from a culture st uh, standpoint and uh, like who Sam Parker is, who Trisha Parker is and built the business. I mean, you, you nailed it. And so uh, I met Sam, uh, talking about age man and so here this is 20 years ago um and he was the first friend that i met at college and he and i got into sales and we went on a crazy little adventure we parted ways for a while he started this business and uh i started back with i started with him started to work for him about four years ago and in all the other industries that i've been in and have been so blessed to be successful in automotive oil and gas um the wireless industry cell phone towers uh, this is the first industry where the truth of like going out to help people and 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 build partnerships with a common goal and in this situation to help people become homeowners. Uh, there's never been an industry that I worked in that it is simple uh, to do, but sometimes not easy, right? And so when we align, and that's really the kind of the the core of our business and how Sam has been able to scale the organization to be gosh, I don't know, 55, 60 people deep now that we have on our team as a credit repair company, right? That only specifically focuses on helping people get into a mortgage. Uh, it, it is all related to building relationships with loan officers and real estate partners uh, to to help advance the opportunities that their clients have. So, you know, when when I talk about that and the structure of how they built, how Sam and Trisha started this business, it really is still... At, at one of our as one of our core values today is to really just help loan officers and real estate agents close more deals get get more clients into houses uh that that kind of mission that that uh has been established is apparent in everything that we do fundamentally as it relates to the relationships we build and then also even to fix credit right so one of the things that i often say is that you're not just dealing with somebody that or a company, right, that is a credit repair company, you're dealing with somebody that understands what it takes to get credit improved and get into a mortgage, because just having the credit score is not always the only key, right? So you have a team of people that understand the underwriting process, they understand the variance between different loans and what can and cannot be uh, left and remaining on credit, right? So like you have that, that level of expertise that's just uh, different than anything else that I've seen as far as our competitors that are out there. And so, um, you know, with us, 
we pride ourselves on the relationship, the loan officer, the clients are super important to us, right? That's how we generate revenue. We build great relationships with them. We have to, in order to get their trust to continue to move them forward, to push through sometimes a lot of things that are, uh, that there's a lot of emotional attachment to as it relates to like previous financial struggles, right? And so for us, just from, from the beginning to measure success by funded loans and homes sold, um, that's a that's another way that that we at my credit guy are much different, right? So I have a couple things that I can show the group as far as like a training and understanding of just kind of some things that are happening in the industry right now. There's some credit score changes. I've also got um, just some some simple simple breakdown of like what is a credit score, what is uh what is FICO, how what's happening right now, what makes up a credit score. So I got I have some options, but just to check Alex or anybody really on on the group here. Who's, who's my audience here? We deal with other loan officers. We have real estate agents in here. What, what, what's the mix? So you have, uh, you have a couple, uh, agents in here, but the bulk is loan officers. I, my suggestion, uh, because I know you're, where you're going with this, like, how do I present this? Right. Do I show them yeah. slide a slide B or slide C my suggestion? And because this is my ex expectation, these are my, are, are my students that you see, um, okay. in the group, uh, besides the, the agents that are in here, I would suggest how do we deliver this content to that people that to the people that need to receive it? Meaning, how do we deliver the content to the consumer so we can better educate them? And then can we have this presentation done in a way that now I can pack this thing up in a box and I can take it down to church on Sunday and teach a class about credit repair or something of that nature? Love it. So here's what here's what I'll definitely do. We'll 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 unpack. I, I think that I can quickly get through two presentations because I want the I want the group to get exposure to them because we're going to do two things. We're going to be able to learn. There's probably going to be some education that happens here for this team to understand more about what how a credit score is created. Also, some changes that are happening in the industry. And then we'll get exposure to these pr two presentations that we can customize for them. So we'll be able to leave this with like some resources that we can we can hand out to this team. All right. And so and in addition to that, I got some other topics as well. Like I have a credit ebook for kids, which is more focused on like our youth. And I have a lot of people that are taking that into schools, doing like a financial wellness presentation uh, to to the youth. And they end up getting a bunch of leads from the faculty that's there, right? Like opportunities. Right. So it's all that mission of like give it away educate, like we can support you in any way. So I think what I want to start with, and I think with this group, right, knowing and being exposed to credit, we can slam through a credit 101 super fast. It's like eight slides. And really, this stuff is going to seem a little familiar. I'm going to dig into some some details here. But when I present and where I and I do this a lot, right, as far as like continued education and credit education, the best way that we all learn is just to pop in questions. I've heard this before. Is it true? Right? Like that. So I'll start right now. I'm just going to share my screen. I think I can do that. And then, um, and let's just roll through this again. These are the basics credit one-on-one basics. So again, while we're looking at this, I'm going to present this to you as if I'm teaching you, but just know that this is something that you can put in front of uh, real estate agents that you're working to attract to be a part of your your team, right? Like you can present this to potential clients. You can put this on social media and speak to it. All of this is available to you when you're a partner of my credit guy at no cost, right? Like all the all the resources that we have are yours. So what is a credit score? Everybody understands what this is, right? It's pretty simple. It's a risk assessment. It's a grading scale, right? And it's you know for for what we're doing specifically for a mortgage. There's actually three credit scores that get produced, right? That's what we call, you may have heard the term tri-merge, right? So a tri-merge is essentially three different credit bureaus that have three different scoring models that produce three different scores. So it's information from the bureaus, an algorithm or a model that's overlaid to that information and the data, the detail of the data that pops out the score, right? So the actual algorithm is the true grading system that's assessing the information to pop out that score, which would be the grade, if that makes sense. So what is it used for? Or very simple. We all know this, right? It's to qualify uh, for a product to determine the interest rate, right? Now, one of the things that is the most common, like confusing thing that happens for the average consumer and even some of my loan officers is even some of my real estate agents is like asking the question or knowing the answer to the question of what is your credit score is like impossible to answer. And here's why there's, and we'll get into some details of this as we continue on, but there's not just one credit score. 
now there's not even one company that's creating the credit scoring models that we're seeing. So you have a lot of people that are looking at some sort of app. And if you don't understand exactly what model is being used, it may not be the model that's being used to assess your, 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 your ability to finance, whether it be for a car, a home or whatever. There's some models that are being used that are just co being called what they call consumer scores, which don't get used in anything, right? So there's a lot of confusion because considering that there's all those different models, that means there's also plenty of different results, right? So we're going to dig into FICO a little bit here, just very quickly. Uh, you know, Bill Fair and Earl Isaac back in 1956 created this business and it was all based on research. But actually the first FICO score that was used for lending was not proposed um, or debuted until 1989. Today, there's over 20, 20 credit scoring models. And to go just a, a little bit further, here's some details of those credit scoring models, right? So like there's nine alone just for when it comes to time to buy a car. These decisions are made by the people that are lending the money, right? So essentially what we have to remember is that these are products that are being purchased by banks. Anybody that finances it, like in the auto category, anybody that finances those vehicles, they're the ones that pick what credit scoring model they use depending on how they're regulated and to assess how they're going to, you know, manage their risk across everybody that they're lending to. So we just have to remember that these truly are products that are being sold, right? Now, in the mortgage space today, you'll notice that right here, there's a FICO 2, 5, and 4. So again, when I talked about the tri-merge, the number two model is being uh, assessed to the Experian data that they have, five on Equifax, four on TransUnion, all right? You'll you'll see here that the newly released are, are number ten, and so they're they're going in an advancement um, as far as like a new edition. So for the mortgages right now today, we're using credit scoring models that were made over twenty years ago. Okay, they are severely outdated. There's a lot of factors that should apply that don't apply, which is why the next piece of this little session here is going to be what's changing in the future. So this is FICO. There's another company called Vantage Scoring Solutions. We'll dig into that more. But when you see a credit score, it really is super important to understand what model is being used if we're going to coach somebody to understand what they're looking at. And again, mortgages specifically here, two, four, and five. The five sections of the credit scoring algorithm, these are the factors, right? This is the weight on that data that's being assessed. This is really kind of like the the behind the scenes of that credit scoring algorithm. This is FICO specific. They put 35% on payment history. Obviously that makes sense, right? How long have you consistently been paying this account on time? And you'll notice if you look at a credit report, it shows a column that either says months, number of months or the term reviewed with a, uh, with a number below it, right? 46, 68, that's the number of months that it's been open, active and reviewed. So the more you know, history, the better, right? Especially if you're paying on time. Credit utilization is the second largest, but the most overlooked, okay? So if you have a $1,000 credit card and you have $500 balance on it, you've utilized that credit line 50%, okay? So FICO assesses each one of your open revolving trade lines, which are 90% of the time they're credit cards. Sometimes it could be like a HELOC, or a personal loan that's open-ended that has a line of credit associated with it, anything where there's a fluctuating balance, and then also usually a fluctuating payment that's associated with it. Again, most commonly credit cards. Now, people get very confused on this because they're saying Capital One's allowed for me to use $1,000. I've never went over that. I've got $700 on there right now. I've never missed a payment. How could this possibly be negatively affecting me? Well, the, re the way that I answer that question is, you are a really good Capital One customer. They're very happy with you. To be honest, they'd even appreciate you more if you were late every once in a while so they could charge you $45 for that late payment. Their interest is making money off of you. How FICO is assessing how those uh, accounts are being used is showing that if you've utilized over 50% of that, you're actually at a risk. So at my credit guy, what we talk to is what we call the 50, 30, 10% rule, okay? Anytime you're over 50%, you're absolutely hurting your credit score, whether it's one credit card or a combination of all of your balances and limits together, right? That ratio applies to the total as well. So over 50, not good. Under 50, better. 
under 30, much better, and under 10% is the best. Actually, FICO specifically states that if you are in their highest achiever category, you are maintaining a balance on your open or revolving trade lines. Most of the time, credit cards at less than 7%. So that might that might seem wild, right? Think about it. If you have three card, credit cards that are all $5,000, they're seriously wanting you to have less than $1,500 that's rolling and revolving. And the answer is yes. If you want that that upper echelon score, right? If you want 780 plus, eight, getting into the 800s, right? You're going to need to to manage those balances very tightly. And then as you would expect, the length of the history, which almost all, also ties into payment history, a mix of credit and new credit are the smaller of the last three. So I want to break something down here real quick. One thing that's important to know is that you don't need perfect credit to buy a house. That's one of the things that we have to reiterate with our clients often, right? Like we just need to clean some stuff up to move forward. The other thing as it relates to this, the, these specific topics is when you're looking at those details of the best, right? Like to get 780 plus and Alex may be able to comment on this a little bit further, but really when it comes down to it, once you hit 740 in the mortgage space, from what I understand, you're getting, you're usually getting about as good as it gets as it relates to, to interest. Maybe, maybe there's times where 760, 780 are going to bump you into a better category, but there's really never a need for you to be maintaining a credit score of, eight, 10 plus, right? It's just, there's not a lot of benefits. And sometimes it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of high maintenance stuff, right? Um, so the good category is going to put you in a great situation a lot as it relates to credit. The other thing that I'll say is that oftentimes we hear things like inquiries are going to hurt your credit dramatically or opening new accounts are going to hurt your account dramatically. They have an effect. They have an effect. That's for sure. But we're not like all too often when there's big talking heads on the internet talking about credit. They're really just trying to incite like people to like get super active and aggressive and, and engaging because they're, they're worried more about engagement than they are the truth. Okay. So like to break this whole, like if you open credit cards, you're going to kill your credit with new accounts. Two years ago, I set out to like prove that out, right? Like, cause everybody was talking about how if you, if you add all these trade lines, it's just going to wreck your credit. So I set out one morning to open up 10 credit cards in my name, right? And I made it to seven because once the other three creditors realized that I had applied and been approved for what was at that time, I mean, like well over $15,000 of new credit that day on credit cards, they said red flag, right? So they can see that detail real time. So on each credit report that was pulled from that point, even if it was a soft pull, they could see that I went Chase Bank, Bank of America, right? Like, and so I, I wanted to prove that even if I did that, it's not going to kill my credit. So I did the before and after. It affected my credit like eight to 10 points and it all was back the next month. And then my credit utilization went way down because now all of a sudden I had an extra 15 or $20,000 of a cushion. So Tony just dropped, uh, let me see here. I'm going to, I missed a couple. Here, I, I can read it to you, Jesse. Go so yep. <clears throat> Miss Schaffner, which she is the newly Miss Schaffner, uh, not new, new anymore, but newer. Uh, she said, what about the clients that want to do a balance transfer from a high rate card to a 0% APR? Do you recommend opening a new credit card and keep the old card open with a zero balance? You nailed it with that last piece, right? I actually just did this this myself. I mean, I play around and, uh, you know, obviously somebody that opens 10 credit cards, they're going to test some things, right? Because there's only so many ways that you can actually get the truth unless you actually do it yourself. So I'm over here hijacking my credit sometimes just to get a full answer. But Tony, the, the so yes, I, I absolutely subscribe to that, right? And you always want to be careful for for somebody like if, if it's like, I need to get a large purchase finance in the next 30 to 60 days, I'm usually saying, let's let's slow down here, right? You don't wanna be changing a bunch of things up right before that happens. But I love the idea because like we, you have to leverage the, the offers that are in front of you, right? So I used to balance transfer on like $2,500. That I mean, credit cards are all high interest, right? I used to did a balance transfer on $2,500. I can pay that off in cash, like whatever, right? But like I maintain balances, I do this and that. But I got an offer from a company that said, it was an existing credit card that I had. And they said, we'll give you zero interest for the next 24 months if you balance transfer. 
Now, what you want to keep an eye on is that there's there's going to be um, like transaction fees. And what you don't want to do is you want to say, like, if you're prepared to pay that off in 24 months, like to me, I get hit with 3% on that balance instead of carrying that balance at, you know, 18 to 24% interest over the next 24 months. So for me, it made total sense, but you just have to look at the details, look at the back of that credit card, like offer on exactly what they're going to hit you for. Uh, which card was that Parker? I moved, um, I moved from, I moved uh, from bank of America to, I got a new chase card, right. Which I'm really trying to work. I'm getting into that whole like chase freedom and like start moving up. Like they have crazy perks and whatnot. I'm going to go down that path to learn more about that too. But my bank of America card was one of those cards that I set up to years ago. Right? So like that card has a fantastic history, right? Like, I was only at less than 10% utilized because I had $20,000 credit limit on there. So what I did is I just transferred it over. Now I'm at zero. Like my, my kid's daycare, I pay that with that every single month. It just automatically comes through. So I know that balance is going to go up and I'm going to pay it down. But I'm keeping that card open. If you were to close that credit card, that's where the dig happens, right? Because you're you, I would have lost two and a half years of perfect payment history. And it, and, and then all of a sudden, I, would, the, I call it the ceiling, right? When I'm talking about like balance, and limit, I say floor, ceiling, right? So lower the floor, raise the ceiling. You got to create that separation. That's the percentage that you have that's that's available. And you want to, again, that's where that 50, 30, 10 rule comes in, right? So for me, I transfer that balance. That's a personal benefit for, from a financial standpoint where I'm not going to be paying as much in interest over the next certain amount of years. Some people are like, I don't pay any interest. I'm not that guy. I pay interest on stuff. I'm fine with it. I'm just keeping an eye on things, right? And so now I move to 0% interest on a balance that I can absolutely pay off in the next two years without it hitting that 25th month. That's the other thing you have to be careful of. Sometimes they will start applying that 25, uh, at 20, let's say it's on the 25th month, let's say their interest rate's 23%. Sometimes they will start to apply that interest rate to the balance that you carry into that 25th month. Just not super aggressive, right? Let's say that I only paid off twenty three hundred dollars of that twenty five. I'm going to pay that interest rate. I'm going to pay the interest on that two hundred dollars that remains. But you have to be careful because some balance transfers will say that if you don't pay that total off from now until that 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 initial uh, amount that you pull over, if you don't pay that all off to a zero dollar balance when you hit the twenty five the twenty fifth month, they can retroactively apply that APR to the total that you transferred over, right? So you just gotta be careful. You gotta, you gotta read the details, right? And so it's not good if that's the deal that you're getting and you do not feel super confident that you will have that paid off in 20, 24 months, right? So there's a lot of detail there, but uh, as long as you know the the specifics, I'm a fan of them. If, if, you're, if you're good with your money and you're careful with it, I don't think that, uh, cause what they're trying to do is essentially just get you to come over and you're going to behave like the average American and you're going to, you're, you're going to end up using it. They're going to make interest off you. Right. Like, but the, I'm, I'm open to those for sure. One, one thing I want to throw in there, Jesse, is this, uh, be, be cautious of, you know, you see these things and they say balance transfer air and, or, uh, you can take the money out. You write yourself a check basically for whatever the, the line is. Right. Um, and so I did that one time and I did that. I'm like, heck, if I can get accessibility that much money that quick and all I got to do is write a check. I took the check into the bank the following day when the check posted, there was a, uh, a, a fee that they charged that I did not pay attention to. And because I wrote the check for the total amount of credit line, it put me over the limit. Yep. And so because I didn't want my credit impacted that way, I ended up paying. I, I had the loan for one day. And I yep. ended up losing $300 off of the fee because in order to zero out the balance, I paid the money back and then paid the fee off to get it back to zero balance. I mean, it was boom and it hit. And so you have to be mindful. If the line, let's say, is $10,000 and the fee is $1,000, don't go write a, a $10,000 check. It's going to put you over the limit. You want to pay attention and write a check for the lesser amount so it doesn't go over the limit because even though that's only one of say a hundred thousand dollars worth of accessibility, you're now over the limit on the card, which creates issues as well. Yeah, it's gonna hurt your credit. And the other thing is that like that's a high cost to borrow that money too, right? So like and and what the what I refer to it as and on and on the back of the offer that you get, there's an APR and then there's also usually what they call a cash advance rate. 
And so you can get, so like with credit cards, you can get access to cash, but they're going to, they're going to hit you so much harder on interest for that. Right. So there's usually a better alternative to get your, to get access to cash somewhere else, right? Look, local credit union, right? Like, uh, go to Alex and do a HELOC or whatever, right? Like there's always some idea that's better than borrowing directly. And then, so it's very important to understand, even with like certain lines of credit, if you were to like transfer that money, like right now I have a line of credit with um, with a bank that I have. And if I transfer that money into my checking account to pay a bill, they they charge, my, they charge interest on that a, a different way. It's the same amount, but it starts now instead of at the end of the billing cycle. So that timing is going to make an impact of how much I'm actually paying in interest. So details are important. Any other questions on that? Okay. Now I'm going to, I'm going to go back to sharing because I'm going to go through some misconceptions. This is kind of the end of the like credit one-on-one training, right? So top five misconceptions, uh, uh, misconceptions, checking your own credit hurts your scores. It's not true. It's called a soft pull. You can check your credit every single day and it's not going to affect you. Paying off the highs this is a big one. Paying off the highest balance collection or charge off will increase your scores the most. So I'm going to, I'm going to unpack this a little bit. Number one, the amount that you owe on a collection or charge off has little to do with how it is impacting your credit score. The details related to that collection were revolving or excuse me, around when it was open, when the date of last activity was, and 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 when it defaulted are much more of a weight of how that's affecting your credit than the amount. So we often, when we're consulting clients, they usually, the average consumer, let's say they have three collections, two of them from six months ago, they're each just a hundred dollars, just small ones. And then one from three years ago, that's $2,000. Nine times out of 10, that person's going to say that thousand dollar collection is hurting me more. It's not though. Those two collections that are $100 are making more of a significant suppression in that credit score than the larger balance. The reason that that's good news is because one, it's the truth and now that no. And number two, we can address a $100 collection a lot easier than we can a $1,000 collection. And if we're, if we're spending less money to make more of an impact, that's good in every category, right? So that's always good news. Um, the other thing that's important in this that I always want to break down is just paying off a collection doesn't mean that it's going to help your score at all, right? It doesn't like if you pay a collection most of the time, it's going to drop your credit score because you're zeroing the balance out. But again, the balance doesn't mean anything as it relates to your score. The FICO scoring algorithm is the only time that it's uh, making an assessment on how much you spend or a balance is specifically your balance to limit ratios on your credit cards because they're they're working through the ratio, right? Your percentage of utilization. So with that being said, you zero that collection out and you have it appropriately worked to negotiate that that gets deleted and gained agreement and got written documentation. There's no guarantee that it's coming off. And almost most of the time it's not. But so all you've done is you've updated the date of last activity that shows that it's more relevant to real time and it will drop your score. I mean, that's honestly... The majority of the work that we do uh, is to protect people on when we're repairing their credit to ensure that if they're spending money to make a positive impact on credit, that it actually is going to do just that. Um, which kind of goes into the third one here, right? When you pay off a debt, it automatically gets removed from your credit report. That is absolutely not true. Keeping your credit card balances at zero will increase your credit scores the fastest. It's counterproductive. If you leave everything at zero and you're never using your credit cards, eventually those credit card companies can stop reporting the um, positive pay history because you're not making a payment, right? If you let it go for a few months, it's fine. But if you leave them for six or 12 months, they can become dormant. The other thing that's happening is that this happened during COVID. It actually happened to me as well. If you're not using your credit lines, they can either close your account or they can take your the limit that they've extended to you and shrink it, right? So it's part of what they do to, to alleviate themselves at a mass level of, of exposed risk, right? So when COVID hit, all these banks are super worried about like what's going to happen. If all these people really do end up going out of work, not making income, they're going to start using and defaulting on credit cards super fast, which is absolutely still true right now. But they took one of my Citibank cards that had a ten thousand dollar limit, and just closed it, just closed it to say you haven't utilized your trade line in over twelve months. That was a learning experience for me. 
And then the last thing is it takes a year, it takes years to rebuild, build or rebuild credit. It's not true. Average customer for us is in our program, three to five months. And if you need to, if you need to establish credit, we're talking three to six months a lot of times. So that's the first quick presentation. We're at uh we're at 35 in the hour right now. I can I can show you the presentation that I have on the changes that are coming with the new scoring models as well, but I'll leave that kind of up to the group. And if you have questions, I'm just here to do the best I can for you guys. I, I think the changes and and listen, group, having the cutting edge, the leading edge on these changes allows you to post social media content that's advanced to your competition. So I'm going to ask that Jesse shares that and here's why. I would much rather be able to do a video and say, hey, listen, in February, Equifax is going to release this new scoring model change that you need to be ahead of as a consumer. What does that mean for you? You get what I'm saying, everyone? So I'm going to ask for that. Can everyone raise your hand if that's okay? Good, good deal. Yeah, let's do that, Jesse. I'm interested to hear that. So I'm going to, I'm going to piggyback on what you just said. And with the content that I have that's available to you guys, you can you can literally create two credit education videos that are absolutely interesting and applicable to your network of influence, whether it be partners in the industry or consumers that you're wanting to attract. You could do a 45 second. I don't know what the Alex, you're way better at video content than I am, but like I think I think the thing is right now, like shorts, right? Like like 35 to, to 50 seconds or whatever. You could drop in with the content that I have, stuff that you can understand and you can re and you could kind of regurgitate, for lack of a better word, to a really exciting, draw you in piece of content for the rest of the year with what I have available to you. Okay, and and all I got to do is just get. I'm going to drop my contact information in here too, so that if you're not currently set up with my credit guy, I can set you up with a referral portal that gives you access to all of our video content all of our co-branded flyers. If you're interested in referring customers to us to get a consultation on credit repair, be a partner, all that stuff, right? Like this isn't a pushy sales thing. We give it away. You come to us whenever you need to, right? So I'll post Thanks. my contact information in as well. Uh, Parker has one question in the chat that I yeah. wanted to address. You mentioned keeping a balance at 7% is the best. Does that mean that you re recommend not paying off the card full in each, each month? Really great question as well. So here's what's interesting about when you pay your card off, right? If you're paying on the due date, your information most likely as far as what your balance in is, is already been pushed up to the credit bureaus. So even if you pay that down to zero, that information on you having a balance already hit TransUnion, Equifax, and Experience. You're not really actually allowing for them to report zero. So it's important to understand when each of your credit cards reports to the national credit bureaus on a monthly basis, because that's when you want to kind of like make sure your payment hits before that does. I pay my credit cards off sometimes to zero for, for three or four consecutive months. I have no problem, no problem there, right? But every once in a while, I'll go swipe the card and I'll even leave them and not use them for a few months. I'll go swipe the card for some, and, and again, remember I opened seven cards in one day. So I have to have every once in a while, I have to have a day where I throw the kids in the car and I go, we're going to Menards, we're going to Lowe's, we're going to Home Depot. And you guys are going to get stuff that you don't need because I got to spend eight to $12 on every one of these stores. Right. And then, and then I'll go, I'll let it hit interest for a month. So I'll pay a buck or whatever. And then I pay them off and I do the same thing. It's, it's, it's about the cycle more, right? Not leaving it dormant for a long period of time. So you can feel comfortable paying yourself off to zero. Just don't leave it at zero, right? Does that make sense? I, want, I wanted to throw one other thing in about that portal. And, and listen, um, this is extremely valuable. When you send clients over there, you can go in that portal to see where they're at as they progress. You get these email updates. And by the way, it, it's kind of like, has anybody ever seen a, a boat? If you throw it in the ocean, you turn the motor off, it kind of floats and goes whatever direction that it wants to go, right? Or the lake or whatever it may be. What Jesse and his team do, because a lot of times our clients that are figuring this out, they're this boat that's kind of, we're floating around and all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, I got a 640 credit score. Chase just sent me a credit offer. You know, they're and then they start getting contacted, right? What they do is they turn the boat and they're like, wait a minute, that's Jamarcus. That's your port right there. Remember you said buy a house? Go that way. And they just got to turn the motor on. Or better yet, you say, hey, 
Parker, listen, I'm your port. You guys stuck here, grab this rope and you can reel them back in. So this helps retain the client for your real estate partner and for your business. I just wanted to throw that in. Yeah, no, it's super important, right? Like, like the value that we provide is we're keeping people pointed in the right direction. We're remembering them, reminding them and holding them accountable for what their goal is. Are you serious about becoming a homeowner? Right. And if they've set up on this journey, it always is right. But things come up, car breaks down, things are going good. You know, like we, we create the most damage when things are going well, a lot of times, right? Like, so they're going to start experiencing some of that. Their credit's going to start to improve. They're going to, things are good. And, and I'll piggyback that whole, like we're, we're, we're making sure that they kind of stay the course. We right now, more than ever, if you have somebody that pulled an application, put it in an application for a house, didn't get approved, right to finance it and then you can clearly see it's because of credit and then you see that over the next six to eight months they're starting to fix credit you want to talk about somebody that's getting targeted more than anybody else out there as it relates to other loan officers other real estate agents that information and that trend upward is being sold every day to hundreds of people have you heard, heard the word trigger leads that's what's happening there right so for us we are doing whatever we can to ensure that that client not only realizes that we're the point of contact as it relates to their credit improvement, but you've got both a loan officer and a real estate agent that are in engaged and involved in this partnership with us and you to get you across that finish line. It just safeguards that whole relationship so that anybody else that calls or tries to poke in, they're not a part of our plan. They're not on our team. We're not getting that client to, to, to seek interest in those other offers. All right, cool. I can slam through. This one's probably going to go quicker because some of this stuff is just uh, is more like timelines and whatnot. But uh, so last year, is it last year? Man, tax line. Yeah. No, well, now it's officially two years ago. But uh, October 24, 2022. This is, um, here's, here's the deal. This is the announcement. FHFA announced that FICO, 10T and Vantage 4.0 scoring models are now going to be the standard for um, mortgage credit reports. And again, if you go back to when we talked about FICO, right now there's three FICO models that are being applied to three bureaus, which produce three scores. So the first question is, does this mean we're going to have six scores now? Because we're talking about going to a buy merge. There's still a lot of questions that have not been answered for that, if I'm being completely honest with you. For somebody that's rolled this out to affect consumers and now less than uh, I, we're, we're still far, kind of a far ways out, but that's why it's so important for you guys to know the changes that are coming and be prepared to can, to uh, consult your consumers because we're moving to trended model. Okay. okay. That T means trended. It means that specifically the last 24 to 36 months of activity is super, super important. That means that right now, what you're doing is going to be affected with the new credit scores. So these are just, you know, Congress passes the law, it needs to be more inclusive, uh, FHFA, FHFA post public listing session, right? So roughly 350 participants, 28 speakers share their viewpoints. This is all uh, leading up to where they made a decision here to approve both FICO 10T and Vantage 4.0 models to be used for Fannie and Freddie Mac. Uh, these are kind of the highlights of what's gonna be the biggest changes as it relates to what a consumer would expect the new additional trade line reporting, right? So rental history is now going to be something that is reported and has the potential to either negatively or positively impact your ability to produce a qualifying credit score for a house, right? So you guys have probably heard that. I can I can make a $2,000 payment on the, on the house I'm renting, but I can't get approved for an $1,800 mortgage because I don't have the credit, right? Like, and everybody says that's, messed up. Well, guess what? Now your positive rental history is going to positively affect your credit if you're paying it on time. So every one of these things comes with a caveat. Just because it's reporting doesn't mean it's good for you. Utilities, gas, electric, your cell phone bill, all that stuff is now going to be a positive factor in the credit score that gets produced for becoming a homeowner. But if you're not paying those things on time, it's going to get reported and it's not going to help you. It's going to hurt you. That's why it's so important for people to understand that these changes are coming down the line. We already talked about this. You guys just saw that, right? Like the scoring model, but this is, um, this is the same. They're not changing at all. Uh, FICO FICO is expecting. So even though they're changing some of the, the dynamics of how things are graded, they're not changing the weight of importance in these categories. We just went over this right here. Right. But 
they're expecting on this model that the uh, defaults on the mortgage are going to go down 17%. Late payments are going to impact scores even more harshly than they do now. If you consolidate debt loan, uh, if you do a co consolidated debt loan on CCs, like on your credit cards, we talked about this a little bit on a balance transfer, but this is more specific if you do debt consolidation. It will be super important for you to change behavior on how you're relying on credit cards for how you manage finances on a monthly basis. Because if the algorithm sees that you tra balance transfer over, right, to a debt consolidation loan, and then these credit cards that you've relieved of balances all of a sudden start going up and you're carrying this other debt, that's going to hit you super hard. They're also expecting, I don't know, I mean, these guys are like, you know how insurance people have like actuary scientists, they understand data like crazy. The models that they're proving out is that we're actually, if we overlaid these new models to the last couple of years of, of mortgage applications that we actually could have approved 5% more people that applied. Here's the new player in the game, Vantage 4.0. They are a joint, well, that's coming next. I'll, I'll save that, right? But uh, the algorithm is adjusted. You'll notice that on payment history for FICO is 35%. This is 41%. Available credit is 2%. Utilization is 20%, right? So big adjustments there. So where you keep your credit card balances on FICO dramatically affects you. It does as well on Vantage, just not even, not, not close to as much. They're expecting a universal expansion of over 40 million more people that will be able to produce a credit score compared to what we're seeing today. And 10.1 million of those will actually be people that will produce a credit score that is 620 plus. So of all the people that now will produce a score, only 25% of those people are actually going to be in the category that we would say is a decent credit score to get a mortgage. It actually completely ignores paid collections. This is a big change. Once it's paid off, it doesn't matter anymore. Right, even if it's still reporting, it's not going to negatively affect credit. General collections have a much more uh, greater negative impact than medical collections, and then they're actually going to ignore medical collections that were reported um, in the previous six months. Right, so if they're they're if they're recent, which seems crazy to me, um, it doesn't matter. Fun little fact here: Vantage Score. It was uh, it's it's. Vantage Scoring Solutions is the organization that was established in 2006. Interestingly enough, it's a joint venture between Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. FICO 10T, uh, no longer a snapshot of today. Lesser impact on uh, adding authorized users. You're, not, you're no longer going to be able to add an authorized user and just piggyback off their, their history of a credit card that they've had open for 20 years. They've kind of uh, pull that out. Paying down CCs rapid is no longer going to have the same effect, right? So a lot of times today, when when I look at a credit report and somebody's just kind of underneath, <clears throat> excuse me, they need 20 to 25 points to get to the next threshold or even to get approved. One of the first things that I do is I look at credit cards. Sometimes we can just drop a couple thousand dollars on credit cards and we go up 40 points, right? Well, that's no longer going to be the case. It's still going to make a positive impact when you lower that total utilization down. But what they're doing is they're actually going to assess where your balance to limit ratios are on a monthly basis. Again, that trended model, like where, where you stood at that balance to limit ratio over the last 24 to 36 months. So the impact that you're making today, that rapid change isn't going to make as much of a, a an impact because we're no longer just looking at a snapshot. Hey, let me, let then, me toss something in there as well, Jesse. If you go back up please. to where it says the authorized user. Um, so... I've used this as a trick and this trick in today's market currently works. Uh, you have somebody with no score, you have them add an authorized user account. Suddenly they have a score because they, they basically pull the score from the individual who has had a card over a length of period of time. Or if you have somebody that maybe their negative stuff outweighs their positive stuff. So you add them as an authorized user to kind of balance it out more. The removal or the lesser impact is really going to make that trick go away. So if that's something that you currently use, or if it's something you've currently done, be mindful of that because that will start to fade away rapidly. Hey, uh, Jesse, the I... new trick, the sorry, new I... trick needs to be, let's keep, let's, let's make sure that these customers understand that if they, if they have a desire to buy in the future, they have to have a credit score, right? Because we could build a credit score if we've got six months, 
if we're coming towards the runway and we got six months to land, we can get a credit score built quick, right? Like that's totally fine. And then also we have a credit builder secured card that reports super fast. That's another alternative, but there's no quick fixes in that category anymore. Jamarcus, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask you about the medical collections being reported six months. Was that reported six, like six months out or within six months? Is that? So, yeah, know? it's. It actually, you know, man, you, you caught me here because I'm looking at this going, I need to look into that a little further. Because, like the way that that's worded, and which I pulled it directly from FHFA, is it ignores med collections reported in the prior six months. So to me, what that reads is if you've had a medical collection that's new in the last six months that's reported, it doesn't, it's not going to factor in. But okay. if it's older than that, which is kind of contradictory to how every other thing works from a credit standpoint. So yeah, I'm right. definitely going to double check on that. Here's what I do know though. There's a couple things. So just in general, you may or may not know this, but medical collections went through a big overhaul in the last two years, right? So there was two different, um, they kind of sunset essentially how things were being reported and being graded. Um, the grading system didn't change. The fact that it reported allowed for it not to factor in any longer, right? So what they did is the first thing is, if you paid a collection down to zero, it automatically got removed from affecting your credit. That was the first rollout a couple of years ago. March of 2023, the same rule applied, but it was for any balance on that collection that was less than $500. Meaning that in March, just this last March, 73% of all medical collections that were reported nationwide just got wiped, right? So there was people that had medical, like, let's say you had 10 medical collections on an event. If you've ever had a medical event where you end up in an ambulance and at uh, uh, emergency room and, and surgery, you will realize like you get flooded coming from everywhere. You don't know what they are. I went through a back surgery that I injury ambulance, embarrassing, right? Like fire firemen carrying me out of my house, that whole thing. And then what well, the one thing was is like, the bills that were showing up, because I was like, I understand that I have some financial liability here, but has this been submitted to my insurance? This and that, right? Who is this coming from? Because because of HIPAA, they can't provide a lot of details on what took place. Like, what is this actually for? And so I was getting one bill from a doctor. Anyways, long story short, you could easily end up with 10 bills that are anywhere from 27 to $80 or uh, $400. All that's off now, right? If it actually went to collection, that's all gone. Now, with this specifically, Vantage 4.0, and then also FICO a little bit as, as it relates to like the weight of medical collections. So obviously like with FICO, they're saying medical collections aren't gonna affect you as much as regular collections, FICO, uh, Vantage is the same. Vantage is going as far as to say, now the most recent update is that any collection that you paid off, any collection, right? You don't even have to get an agreement for them to delete it from your report. If it's still reporting and it's at zero, it's no longer gonna affect your credit. That is one difference from that, from Vantage and FICO. But yeah, I, that's uh, that seems odd to me, the ignore medical collections. I would assume, right, if I was just to, to think kind of rationally here, it's anything that was uh, reported outside of the prior six months, right? So if it, if, it, if it exceeded six months to when it hit credit, it's no longer going to affect. But I got some homework to do on that. And then uh, Alex had mentioned him here. This is my buddy, Sam. He's a CEO. I, I should be more professional. He's the CEO of our company. And he and, he and his wife have built a great business uh, that's that's based in integrity. And, and if you guys are interested, I drop my contact information in. We can partner further. I can get you set up with a referral portal. And then more information like these presentations are available to you at any time. So like um, this information, right? So like I believe that just this information here on this one slide deck I mean, that literally could produce 20 short videos for you on social media content. Uh, and then the one that was prior to that, e even more, right? Now, what I want to make sure of is that like everybody right now in the industry is trying to say like, what can I be a subject matter expert in to some extent that's on the fringe of what I do directly, right? So it's important for us to understand what's happening in the mortgage industry. It's what's important for us to understand how credit cards work, right? And for us, those things allow for us to draw clients in to do what we do best and it's credit, right? And I think for you guys, being able to talk about credit, right, a bit um, is, is definitely going to be helpful. I am going to share my screen again because, uh, and we got like five minutes, so I'm going to make this super, super quick. But I want to show you guys the portal quick of where you can access some of this content. 
And then Alex, I'll let you take it from there. While I'm pulling this up, you guys can ask any questions that you have or anything like that as well. Just FYI, you're not sharing your screen right now. I don't know if you thought you were or not. Yeah, I'm uh, gonna I'm gonna pull up this and gotcha. open it, and I'm I'm back at it. I appreciate that though, for sure because I've been that guy. Hey Jesse, um, I do actually have another question, and I apologize if you covered this already. I was having service okay. service connection connection issues at the beginning of the call, but um, so to circle back to somewhat of the medical question, um, usually what I'll tell my customers is whenever they have medical collections versus like regular collections, you know, credit cards, installment loans, things like that, I would tell them to prioritize the list meaning leave the medical collections at the bottom. Um, and then instead of paying more money towards the like installment collections, credit card collections, things like that, pay towards your credit card balances, kind of like what you were saying with the 7%. Um, is that like, is that good advice, bad advice? Uh, what are your thoughts on that, man? It's not bad advice in the sense that there's times where that makes perfect sense but the problem is is that like it's really hard to make a general statement at all related to credit as it relates to fixing it specifically so like building and maintaining we can make general statements right because they're they're pretty standard but if you're talking about somebody that has credit issues today that's why it's important i believe it's you know this is again not super sales pitch here but i think it's super important to have a, a, a relationship like ours because you're right. when, instead of like giving that detail you can say Here's what I have for you. We've got a team that will review your specific situation that's unique to you to assess your best opportunity to repair, right? And they're going to give you that game plan because they're a partner of ours at no cost. And if you want to execute that, that game plan on, on your own, right? If you want to go start tackling some of these things on your own, you've got the direction now to do it. But they're also going to explain how they can help, right? And the reason I say that is because for me, if I'm looking at high credit cards, multiple different variations of collections, Actually, the medical collections for me usually is going to be the first priority because okay. I know that because of the new rule, if they're paid, right, right even before right. these new algorithms roll out here at the end of 2025, right now today, if you pay a medical collection, even if you settle it, right? So that's where we get super aggressive. You could take a $2,000 medical collection that's three years old. My team can go in like a bulldog and negotiate for your client to get that thing paid down to zero, but for only $800. We could, It's called settled for less than full balance. They're going to note the file, but it'll still show a $0 balance. Now we've saved the client $1,200 and it automatically gets taken off the credit report. So right. for me, medical collections are low hanging fruit. It's all about the framework of it, right? And so if you leave the client to themselves to say, hey, you know, if you pay that medical collection off, it's going to go to zero. Your score is going to go up. That's a true statement. But why pay $2,000 and my team probably can get it done for $800 to $1,000 or $1,200, right? right? So like those things I think are super important. One of the one of the biggest issues that's caused is when somebody goes to try to fix their own credit. I promise you, right? This isn't... This is not a credit repair salesman saying you can't do anything on your own. I promise you. And it's coming from a guy that when I bought, I bought a fixer upper house that I'm sitting in right now. I love this thing. And I was like, I'm going to fix all this stuff myself. And I, I did, but I'm doing it again through contractors, right? There's some things you can do on your own. And I'm not saying everything I did here was, was not great, but like that it's, it's true for credit too. Right? So I think general statements on building and maintaining credit are good. I think specific like what you should do to fix, I think you need some consultation there. And we're open to do that for you at no cost. But I would say medical collections first, I would avoid charge off. Well, usually, I usually don't throw any money towards charge offs because like they don't affect DTI on a, on a, uh, on a loan. Right. So that's not super helpful. And it's usually not bumping credit and they're usually really high. I'm going to pick out low hanging fruit just to get them to a six twenty six forty. Right. Okay. Thanks Jesse. You bet. All right. So just a super, we're running out of time here and I'm sorry, this I'm notorious for this, but uh, I'm going to show you an example of the referral portal that if you're a partner with us, you'll get, this would be Michael Scott's the loan officer or the real estate agent. Okay. Just a quick snapshot here. This is a dummy account. These are the clients that Michael has that are currently in credit repair. So you would have a, an overview that showed you everybody that's enrolled in credit repair right now. And we'd be updating you on the progress of those, but you could also log in here at any time, click on their name, 
go into their account, see the progress that they've made. These are the leads that we're pursuing. Lead is what we call the people that we're calling to do a credit review. And all you have to do to send it over to us is just go in here and put in their information and click send. Within this dashboard, you can also get a full video library that you can download. And so here's what's happening right now for content. You just hijack these things, take them, download the video, stitch. So on the front end, you do an intro. Hey, it's Jesse at My Credit Guy. My guy Sam over here is going to talk about life after bankruptcy and credit. Take a peek. And if you have any questions, let me know. Right? So now all you're doing is two... 20 second intro, and then Sam's doing all the work that you already have pre-recorded and you just stitch that video together. That's super, super common today. Um, the other thing I wanna show you just super, super fast is this is uh, our flyers and infographics. All of these, like this content for flyers related to FICO versus Vantage, Credit Builder Card, My Credit Guy Pricing, Your Guide to Collections, Handling Disputes. What we've done is we've created these flyers that you could co-brand. You'll notice at the bottom left-hand corner here, We've kept that open so that you can put your name, contact information, headshot company logo, and you can use those wherever it is that you see fit. That's a tremendous, tremendous amount of value. Um, listen, guys and girls, uh, when I asked Jesse to please be a part of this, there was zero, zero, zero hesitation on his behalf. He said, absolutely, when, where, what time, Okay. The reason why that's important is because Jesse and my credit guy and Sam are partners. All right. This isn't Lexington law, not to throw places under the bus where it's like, yeah, send me $120 a month. We're going to send out six prepaid envelopes and maybe something will happen sometime somewhere. And, and here's the thing. Most of your client base has heard of that or they've been in that. Right. And after 12, 14, 18, 24 months, they saw no progress. So they gave up. Now you're back and you're telling them we have this solution. Okay, well, what does the solution look like? Oh, sounds just like Lexington Law. It doesn't. I need you to investigate it deeper. The other thing is the commitment level, right? So you have somebody, listen, if I come to you and say, I'm going to buy a house, I want to buy a house, tell me how to buy a house. If that person says, give me a resource and you say, talk to Jesse, if they make contact, you got a serious person. If they execute and actually align and do the things, you got a really serious person, which means what? You have a really strong lead that you need to maintain, you need to nurture. But more important than that, you have a connection with somebody that you can send them to that's reliable, that's trustworthy, that you know that people are gonna get the value from because that is the biggest thing is value. Now, Jesse touched on this. A lot of people, oh, I'm gonna fix it myself. I remember like 12 years ago, sitting at a, a mortgage company and there was a guy next to me. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? He's like, I'm sending out all these letters for my clients. Time consuming. And it wasn't right. In 30 days, I'll get this thing in the mail and it'll tell them this. And if they don't dispute it in 30 days, it'll go away. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, bro, you spent more money on stamps than they would have to buy Zillow back then. Right. And so because of things like that, we use trusted partners. Listen, we expect realtor partners to be like, I'd love Tony. She's amazing and only Tony. But yet when it comes to credit repair, we're like, yeah, uh, go pay this down, do this, do this, do this, do this and go away. We're not educated to do this. And I want to, I want to lead one more thing. There is a financial liability in advising people on credit repair when you are not a licensed credit repair specialist. You could get penalized by the state if you are not a licensed credit repair specialist and you are giving advice on how somebody can repair their credit okay so you need to be cautious of that understanding the videos the content the stitching together very simplistic he said hijack it go still fast now or like we say uh what's it tactically um acquire, yeah. tactically acquire right we go to tactically acquire this information and so what oh, that means God. is we're giving it and we're taking it and we're making it our own and we can duplicate it. Okay. And we can get it out fast. So next time you guys and girls say, I don't know what to do a video on. Don't just go over to that library and find things. It's original content, by the way, it's advanced content. Your competition is not talking about this right now. You know what they're saying? Interest rates have come down again. We're at all time lows for the week of January the 10th. Cool. Thanks, bud. How about you tell me how to get my credit score higher so I can get that better tier rate at the 740, 760, 780, or whatever it may be, instead of telling me about 6.5% interest rates for people with the 580. Tell me how to get my credit better. So now I can go out and buy the Raptor at 2.99% interest instead of 8.99. Yep. 
tell me how I can make my credit better so I can take advantage of the American Express Platinum card instead of the uh, Capital One. I put a down payment down for 300 bucks and now I have a $300 credit line card, right? There's no wrong start, but let's lead the people to premium water instead of saying, here's a bucket, not quite sure what's in it, but it's liquid, drink it, right? One, one of the things that a lot of our partners are doing right now is they're hitting their existing database of loans that they've closed six, 12, 18 months ago that they knew they got the deal done at, you know, 600 to 660 with a title of, our, uh, is your credit ready to refinance, right? Because if rates do drop and people are all queued up ready to refi and, and their credit's not better than it was, they're not either going to be available to do it or it's not going to be the best deal that they could do. So a lot of times what we do people put us in this bucket of where it's like, if you can't get somebody approved, this is your solution. That's not true. Like credit optimization is a real thing. Taking somebody from a six. And, and if I'm being totally honest with you, clients that enroll in our program that are currently at a 660 that want to go 740 plus, they have the money available and they value our service more than the person that's currently at a 550 that needs to get to a 620, right? It's the same swing. It happens faster. They have money available to do it and they value it more. And they will look to you for appreciation and say, this is a great idea because the numbers that you can put in front of them in three, six or nine months when it's time to refi, right? With an improved credit score, dramatically different. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge in its value. So listen, when we get off this call, start thinking of those people, right? Start thinking of the situations where you can bring additional value. Start talking about things like, hey, um, you, you know, uh, what was there was a, a Angela. Angela was was is, she's an agent, right? She's a licensed real estate agent. And if not, that's okay. We're gonna use Mark Schaffner for an example. Pick up the phone and call Mark and say, Mark, hey, listen, I got this amazing class that I can put together and that I can present. Do you have a group of people that could utilize credit repair that we can market to and we can talk to? And I can do a one hour presentation on what they can do to help elevate their credit and connect them with an individual that can help bring their scores up and give them basic knowledge. Oh, by the way, it doesn't have to be credit repair. Could you get me in front of a group of high school students that want to understand how to prepare for the next chapters in their lives by developing credit? And just like, I think Jesse said this in the beginning, who's there? Faculty? The principal, the doctors, right? The people that are in the school. What if you did that at a youth camp? What if you did that at a recreational center? What if you did that anywhere? You have to stop looking at the influence of being the audience you're standing in front of, but the people that are present as well. You could go to a prison, literally a prison. I don't recommend it, but you could go to a prison and do a credit educational class. And guess who's there? Correctional officers, the warden, whoever, right? You have people to market to. Okay, so we'll be like, wow, well, no, no prisoners can buy a home. I promise they need a place to live when they get out. There you go. <laughs> so, they, they got verifiable income, right? They made 19 cents in, an hour for the past 22 years through the Department of Tennessee. So I'm teasing on that one. But but look outside of the box and who else can utilize this information. Feed this information, this, this new information that's coming available for what's going on with FICO scoring and everything else. Feed it. Get it out there. Somebody is watching you right this minute, absorbing everything that you put out. Grow that audience. Jesse, you are the man. Thank you so, so much. Listen, if you don't have a trusted credit resource, you do now. If you have a trusted credit resource, you have another option. Because just like anything else, if you ever run into a situation where that credit resource moves, shuts down, drops the ball, whatever it may be. I, I, I'm going to give you a prime example of drops the ball. I called State Farm yesterday. Ugh. My A deer hit my truck. You guys know about this. It's been like six weeks now. No issues. I call my agent's office. They answer the phone. They say this. Thank you for calling Chris Woodley State Farm paired with Rocket Mortgage. How can I help you? I said, excuse me, what'd you say? She said, thank you for calling State Farm. I said, oh, I, I thought you said Rocket Mortgage. She didn't say a word right? Joe gets on the phone. I said, ah, thank you for calling all state, right? I'm like, bro, what is that? I said, so when my clients call you, they're being introduced to Rocket Mortgage. I, I have a responsibility to reevaluate my decisions to do business with them because they chose to integrate Rocket Mortgage. And if my clients call them and they've integrated that, what are they doing to my clients? There may come a time where your best partners 
make decisions that aren't best for your people and you have to move. And so if you're in a situation where that has happened or could happen or will happen, if my credit guy isn't your credit guy, you should consider him being so. Okay. All right. Everyone good? Any questions? No, do me a favor, everybody. Listen, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to put Jesse out on the streets a little bit here. I want everybody to send Jesse a message to at least get access to their portal so you can utilize their information. Right. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but do that because it's information that's valuable and that you can use. So please do that. And thank you, Jesse, so very much for your time. You bet. Anytime, man. We appreciate you so much. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. All Thanks, right. Jesse. See you guys. We'll see everyone. Thanks, guys. <laughs>